Welcome to episode 7, Finding God in Daily Life, the Ignatian Examine Prayer. You know, I really love being a diocesan or secular priest. The religious priests have their specialties. The Dominicans write books, the Franciscans serve the poor, the Jesuits give retreats 24-7. But my brothers and I are like the GI of priests. We are a jack of all trades and master of none. And that means that my life and my day and my week and every second is filled with great variety. And I love it. I started out in my priesthood at at St. Charles, a parish in Northeast Minneapolis, learning how to be a priest, kind of like Nativity. And then I went on to be assigned as a spiritual director and formator at a college seminary. I had to learn about psychology and how to do spiritual direction. Then I was made the pastor of a suburban mega parish and I was made a CEO of a multi-million dollar corporation. And now here I am at Nativity, the peach, the flagship. That's a lot of pressure, but I'm excited to be here. I love it. So at Nativity, one minute, I'm going into the classroom and uh, helping kids to maybe paint or to read a story to them. Next, I'll be in the eighth grade teaching morality. Then I'll go to a finance meeting. Then I'll go to a strategic planning session helping our staff to work together and coming up with strategic priorities like you would do in your business. Next, I'm leading marriage prep, but it's been interrupted by an anointing call, so I have to go to the hospital and do that. Then I might get a difficult email and manage to get through other emails and delete all of those from vendors who want our services for things. Uh, Then I have to go to another council meeting and say daily mass and do funeral prep uh, in anticipation of the next time of confessions that I have. Confessions themselves are so great, I I can't tell you a word about them. But they're random. I mean, I'm going to have Joe Sixpack, and then I'm going to have Sister Christian. And there's just a variety of different people who come to confession. Then I'm dead tired and I go to sleep. And I know that all of you can relate to my experiences because your lives are probably far more random than mine is. So we need a prayer to deal with the randomness in our lives, don't we? You and I, secular priests and lay people. What we need is a prayer that can help us prioritize the randomness of our lives and keep the main thing, the main thing, the main thing. Voila, echo the examine prayer. It was initially proposed by St. Ignatius of Loyola in the 1500s and refined by subsequent uh, spiritual theologians in the last 50 years or so. It consists of a five-step process meditating upon the randomness of the previous day that we've just lived through. So there's five W's and an H about the examine prayer I'd like to share with you. Who can pray it? Anyone. Don't need to be a monk, a priest, or religious. What is the examine prayer? Well, it's not simply an examination of conscience and preparation for confession. It includes this, but it's broader than preparing for confession. It's an exercise of how God shows up in the details of everyday worldly events, how God is found in the ordinary, in the ordinary experiences of life. And as we look at our lives, we find patterns of how God has graced those events or how we have resisted grace in those events. That's the what. But when do you pray it? It's best prayed toward the end of the day, not necessarily when you're conking out for the night, but perhaps before or after dinner. A good time to reflect upon the movements of the day. How long is it? Five to ten minutes. I think we can all handle that. You don't have to pray long to pray. You can just pray well in a shorter way. Where can you pray it? Anywhere. And why should you pray the examine prayer? Couple reasons for that. The examine prayer is burnout insurance. All of us are moving so quickly. How do we describe our lives to our friends? We're busy. I'm busy, you're busy. But how do we prevent the burnout of daily life? When we risk missing out on so many graces that God has given us because we're so busy going through the day. The examine prayer helps us to slow down. It even helps me to talk slower right now. The examine prayer helps us to slow down and savor 
the grace that God has given us. Because God is so generous. It's like God has this hose and fine wine is being flushed at us in a very amazing and insistent way. But we need to slow things down and savor this fountain of fine wine that God gives us in his grace each day. The examined prayer helps to link us up with the action and how God has graced us in our lives with our own prayer time. So the examined prayer is a prayer and not simply thinking about the day. It's reflecting on the day, but it's then sharing how you feel about the day with God and being open so that God can continue the conversation that he initiated with you earlier in the day. The examined prayer, simply put, helps to strengthen our friendship in Christ by mutual self-revelation. That's what a friendship is all about, is I reveal myself to you and you reveal myself to me. So the examined prayer helps us to discern the spirits, to be a grand central station in the spiritual life. All roads lead through the examined prayer in our daily life. And the goal is to not miss any of the graces that God has given us and to not miss any of the sins that we've committed so we can repent from those sins. It's a very, very flexible kind of prayer. We should pray it because we can pray at any time of day. We can stay with any one of those five steps. We can pray them out of order. And especially, we just need to abide and be at peace with the most important thing that God has done for us in the day. God is in the details. And when we stay with the most important thing, God can do miraculous things in us. But if we don't pray the examined prayer, we could miss things that God wants to do for us. So how do we pray it? The five steps. The first movement or the first step is gratitude. We take time to remember that we are poor and that nothing we have comes from, from ourselves. We are beggars before God, so we give thanks for all the good things he's given us. Gratitude is huge. Secular psychologists will say that gratitude is one of the most important things you can do when you suffer from depression. Gratitude is essential because it keeps the envy demon at bay. The moniker of the envy demon is that there's something special missing and you gotta have it. The good life is elsewhere. It's not here in this life. It's over across the street or across the fence. Someone else always has it better and that is a lie. So the first step of the examine prayer is gratitude. The second step is petition or prayer for light. The examine prayer is not simply thinking, as I said, about our day. It's thinking about our day with God and inviting the Holy Spirit into our day to show us what we need to know. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. I pray this prayer all the time. And even my cameraman staffer is sick of me praying this at every staff meeting. We need the Holy Spirit to do anything. So we pray, come Holy Spirit, show me what you're trying to show me about this day, Lord. Third, we get to the heart of the examined prayer, review. The, in the heart, we ask God to lift the veil of ordinariness and to show us the inner workings of his laboring to love us as we go throughout our day. So we think and ask God to show us. What experiences resonated with us today? What experiences were dissonant with our being today? How did God bless us in all the hours of the day? Now is the time in your prayer to go through those hours. So for Father Dufford, for example, it's like 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., and so on. Father T is not quite like that. It's a little different. But we go through the day, hour by hour, and we ask God, what was most prominent in this hour? You don't have to spend a lot of time, and it's just a little bit. But use your tool of paying attention to reality to help you to find God in each instant of the day. Go through each hour and just notice, oh, 
that's right, I went for a walk with God in nature. I forgot about that. And I had the sense of how good God is with the abundance of flowers that I saw. Or for example, I had a conflict with the person at work today and I, I kind of blew it. I really unloaded it at him. I better repent from that and apologize. Or I was kind of confused about this, Lord. Or boy, I was loved today and this thing that happened with my spouse today is awesome. Lord, I think there's something more in here than just human love. Maybe it's the sacrament of marriage that I'm touching. And again and again and again, where did I sin? Where did I see God? The emphasis isn't quite yet on, what, on how you fail to receive his grace. It's still on God's initiative, which is the foundation of prayer in the spiritual life. But then naturally you move on to the fourth step, which is to be able to ask for forgiveness. In this fourth step of asking for God's forgiveness, we look for patterns. We look for patterns by which we may have sinned against God or we've done good things against God. Because this is something you do every day. And if you do it every day, you're gonna, find, you're gonna come up with those same sins you do every day. And soon you're gonna get sick of yourself. You're gonna get sick of the fact that you commit the same sins every day because you keep confessing them to God every day. Voila, you are now dealing with your predominant fault and advancing in the spiritual life. So the fourth, the fourth step there is asking for God's forgiveness and receiving love in the places where you don't deserve the love. That's how God rolls. He rolls by chastising you and making bad things feel bad in you through guilt. But he doesn't want you to have that guilt turn into shame, as I said previously. He wants you to be able to receive love in the guilt. And through confession or through venial sins, small sins, confessing them to God, or receiving Holy Communion with venial sin, you receive his forgiveness and peace. So in this step, you take a minute to find out from God by asking him, Lord, why did I sin in this situation? What was I feeling right before I committed a sin of impurity against self? What was I, what was I feeling when I committed a sin against my spouse? What was happening in my heart, Lord? Was it loneliness? Was I missing intimacy somehow from that? Lord, what was the need that I had that I chose to have sin addressed rather than you to address? So Lord, I repent from that because I want you to speak to me in that place where I am hurting right now because I need you. This is the fourth step and it can bring great renewal and great confession, great preparation for confession. Because then you won't come in necessarily with a laundry list of sins, but you'll come in with a, a contrite heart, sorry for how your relationship with God has been damaged through your prayers. That's a great way to prepare for confession. Five, renewal. This is a great step because sometimes when you go through all of the other four steps, nothing hits you. You're like, okay, come Holy Spirit, I'm grateful again. Nope, nothing much happened today. But Lord, tomorrow, there's some really big stuff going on. So the flexibility of the examined prayer affords you the privilege of simply spending time on this fifth step, which is to anticipate the needs of tomorrow based upon the track record of God's goodness to you in the present moment and how we reflected on how he's been present with you in the past several months, weeks, and years. So you look ahead to future experiences with hope, a well-grounded hope that God has been faithful to you in the past, so he'll be faithful to you in the present. So you ask God, Lord, I need to be patient tomorrow. Lord, I need to fire someone tomorrow, and I don't want to do that. I don't. And so as an example of that, what you need to do is ask God for peace of heart in that difficulty. So to conclude, Ignatius has three steps that can help you examine your heart. Be aware, understand, and take action. For additional reading, read the Examine Prayer by Father Timothy Gallagher. It's been a privilege to be with you here in this video series on prayer, and I wish every blessing upon you as you continue to pray. God bless.
In addition to the examination of conscience at the end of the day, I'd like to do an exam in the middle of the day. A real quick check-in with our Lord. Look back at the morning, how'd it go? Look ahead to the afternoon and evening, what's coming? Check-in, about the time of the Angelus, ideal. And, and it's even better when I have something really concrete and particular that I'm working on, that I can look at and think about. Uh, maybe a little mortification during the day, an aspiration when I begin every task, am I doing that? A smile with uh, the new person coming in to my office, whatever it might be, I can look and say, how'd the morning go? What's ahead for the rest of the day? Check in with our Lord and wonderful aspiration that I love to use at the end of that midday examination. I'm sorry, thank you, help me more. So for me, the practice of examining my conscience and examining my day every evening has been really valuable. So I want to share two points with everyone, one of which is pretty practical, um, and the other is more, dare I say, spiritual. So the first point, um, what do I do when I examine my conscience? Pretty simple, I stop for a few minutes every evening, usually as I'm getting ready for bed, and I cast my mind over my day. I think about what I did, which I shouldn't have done, and what I neglected to do, which I should have done. Sometimes the things I see are sins, and I jot those down for a future confession, but a lot of times they aren't the level of sin. They're not really breaking God's laws, but they are things that I can't really imagine God is pleased with. An impatient attitude, not making an effort to be cheerful in a, you know, situation where it would have been helpful, uh, letting my mind wander at mass or in my prayer. And I sometimes jot those things down too, especially if I want to pray about what was going on there or if they pertain to some particular effort I'm making to improve in a virtue or to you know, tamp down a vice. I only spend a few minutes doing this, but it's hard to do. At bedtime, I'm tired. And also, it just isn't fun to pay attention to my sins and my faults and my vices. It's humiliating. So I also try to think about the good things that God helped me to do that day, that the hour of hard work that I remembered to offer up for someone, um, keeping my temper when provoked, or like just remembering to smile at somebody as I pass them on the street. I know that I'm only able to do those things because God helped me, so it's not a matter of patting myself on the back, but rather that I'm thanking him for his grace. That's my first point. My second, just this. I try to remember that these couple minutes at the end of the day aren't about record keeping. They're not about pleading guilty or pleading not guilty in front of a judge. They're not even a kind of self-help practice. Rather, they're just a few minutes of back and forth conversation with my Father God. He helps me to see what he wants me to see about my day, about my behavior. And I say, I'm sorry, and I say, thank you. It's kind of like what happens when we're tucking our little ones in for bed. Uh, we say, you know, wasn't it a good day? I love you so much. Or we say, I'm sorry we got so mad. Let's try harder tomorrow, okay? And then I can go to sleep, securing God's care, securing God's love.